Hi, this is Stephen Haynes of Haynes Fire and Risk Consulting. Welcome back to Rural Water Supply in the 21st Century, Part 3. So why do buildings burn down? In Parts 1 and 2 of the program, we primarily focus on what needs to be accomplished water supply-wise in order to put a fire out, or put a structure fire out successfully. In Part 3, we're going to use the same needed fire flow versus degree of involvement curves to discuss what commonly happens to us on the fire ground that we are not able to gain control of the fire. And then we're also going to talk about uh, specific examples of operational planning issues that could lead to these problems. In our first example, we call this insufficient flow duration. The first arriving assignment, or the initial alarm assignment, arrives on location. It has sufficient water flow capacity at this point, you're represented by the red dot. The problem is it doesn't have enough water on hand to sustain that needed fire flow long enough to take out the fire curve. So essentially what ends up happening is our fire is growing. We miss it because we ran out of water. It kind of falters for a little bit and then it picks up steam and it runs away from us and until such time that we resume our water supply and are able to get ahead of it if we're able to get ahead of it. So what are some of the possible causes of insufficient flow duration? First and probably most common, particularly during uh, working hours, is all of our trucks did not get out or they did not get out fast enough for us to sustain our flow. Uh, we had inadequate tank capacity, including the initial alarm. Are we running around with 500 gallon trucks versus 1,000 gallon trucks? Or engines, I should say. Uh, the water cannot be moved between trucks fast enough. Uh, in this case here, we've got water stranded in trucks, but we can't move it from one vehicle to the other. We can't get that water moved forward to the fire scene. Uh, one of the hidden culprits in there is the insufficient sizing of pump the tank piping. One of the things to keep in mind when you have a truck built is the NFPA 1901 only requires your tank to pump to be able to flow 500 gallon a minute with the tank 80% full. So if you're looking for a needed fire flow of 750 gallon a minute and you want to punch the fire, you're not likely not going to get it from your tank to pump unless you've specifically enlarged that piece of piping and the valve. Uh, some other causes, no nearby pump, ponds, cisterns, or other water sources were available. Or maybe they're frozen over. Or we didn't have the pumps, the hydrants, or the other equipment that we could effectively utilize them. Or we had drafting issues, and it really comes down to the, the top three. Uh, the top three would be vacuum leaks, bad primers, or the wrong driver. Because we all have to face it. There's, there's drivers out there that can get water from a rock if you send them to the drafting hole. And there's others that couldn't get water from a, a creek if you parked them in the middle of it. Uh, command, and, command or dispatch delayed the request for additional tank vehicles. That, that could be a killer. Or we had water wasted due to poor application, misdirected streams, or we left a lot of water stranded in our hose lines. We gotta be very cognizant of this when we're pumping uphill long hose lays on long driveways, that every gallon of water that you push up that hill that takes to fill the hose is not gonna be usable on the fire ground. It's particularly noticeable when you start getting into five inch and larger hose. Uh, five inch hose will take up a gallon per foot just to fill the hose. This case is actually an extension of the first case we talked about, and, and we'll call this inadequate flow. The initial alarm assignment showed up with enough pumping capacity, but not enough water. However, in this case, we did get a secondary water supply into play, and it came in into play right here with the red square. The problem we've run into with this case is here's our sustained water supply. Let's say this is coming from a drafting hydrant down the street. It is that by the time this got put into place, the fire has already exceeded its ability to extinguish the fire. So what's going to end up happening is we're essentially going to flatten this curve out because we're going to keep fighting it, drowning it, and making it burn slower until eventually this fire gets back down into the, within the capabilities of our water supply. So what are some possible causes for inadequate flow? Uh, once again, all of our trucks did not get out or did, did not get out fast enough. Inadequate hose lays. Uh, we've got pump capacities too low. We're using hose diameters that are too small or hose lays that are too long for the size of the hose. We've got uh, valves, fittings, and appliances in our hose lays or on our trucks that have very poor friction loss characteristics. Uh, in this case here, we could be also looking at an inadequate tanker shuttle. 
Uh, the aggregate tank capacity on our trucks is too low for a distance that we're trying to move the water. Uh, the tanker circulation time or travel is too great. Uh, we delayed the initiation of the, of the supply or the request for the vehicles needed to establish it. Uh, water cannot be moved between the trucks fast enough. And once again, there's that hidden culprit in there with the uh, inadequate sizing of the pump to tank piping. I like to refer to this case as too little too late. Once again, our initial assignment arrives with sufficient pumping capacity, but not enough water on board. It takes them quite a while to get their secondary water supply established, whether that be with tankers or hose lays. And the worst part is, is by the time they get it established, the fire has already grown beyond the capacity of that water supply. So what's going to end up happening, we're going to end up slowing the combustion of the building down. We're going to stretch it out, the curve, and then once that fire gets back down to the capacity of our secondary water supply, we should get a fairly quick knockdown. But then again, we've pretty much lost most of the structure at that point. So what are some possible causes for too little too late? Uh, first and most common is all of our trucks do not get out or they do not get out fast enough. Incompatible hose fittings. So instead of getting water to the fire, we're out in the middle of the street trying to get trucks connected to each other. Uh, drafting issues uh, caused by vacuum leaks, bad primers, or the wrong driver at the water hole. Uh, water cannot be moved between trucks fast enough due to the layout of the trucks, the quantity of firefighters available, uh, insufficient sizing of our pump to tank piping or maybe command or dispatch delayed the initiation of the supply or the request for the vehicles needed to establish it. I just want to step back to this slide once again just to further emphasize that if we take a look at this water supply right here, how do we reduce the amount of time in half that it took us to get it established? We could have gotten ahead of this fire. So it's not just that it's not the volume of the water in this case, it's this delay in getting it in place that really caused a problem. This case here is uh, my rendition of too little too late with a tanker shuttle. In this case here, the tankers are arriving. They've got the flow capacity, they're able to dump. They've got more than enough water to overlap the next tanker. So we end up with a fairly healthy continuous water supply, actually equivalent to about 75% of our needed fire flow. The problem is, is by the time we get this tanker shuttle and this continuous flow established, the fire's more or less at about 80, 85% almost 90% of the needed fire flow requirement for the entire building. So what's going to happen is this fire is going to continue to grow, grow a little slower, it's going to burn a little longer until it comes back down to within the capacity of our tanker shuttle. So what are some possible causes of the too little too late scenario in a tanker shuttle operation? Uh, first, our closest tankers did not get out or get out fast enough. Our secondary and tertiary tankers are coming from too far away. Uh, too much traffic, tractors, bridges, detours, drivers getting lost, which caused the tankers to be delayed in responding or arriving at the site. Incompatible hose fittings. Uh, the water cannot be moved between the trucks or the dump site fast enough. Uh, maybe we initiated a dump site too early. We could have initiated a nursing operation and put the fire out, but we started to go for a dump site operation, which delayed things. Or maybe command and dispatch or command or dispatch delayed the request for the tanker assignment. This next case I like to refer to as slug flow and is unique to tanker shuttles. Matter of fact, I would suspect that most of your tanker shuttles, even those that we consider successful, start out with slug flow first before they finally achieve a continuous water supply. In this case here, our tankers are arriving. They've got the dump capacity or the nursing capacity, but there's not enough water on board to carry it through to the next tanker when it arrives. Uh, so we're, we're pumping water, we run out of water, Next tanker arrives, we pump water, we run out of water, the next tanker arrives, or we're, we're pumping water, slowing down because we know we're going to run out of water, and, and then we start all over again. So we end up with a slug flow syndrome. We never really get a continuous flow. If I had to guess, our probably our continuous flow rate under this scenario is probably down in this level here. So what are some possible causes of slug flow? Our secondary and tertiary tankers are coming from way too far away. Our tanker circulation time, our travel distance is too great relative to the individual tanker sizes. Basically our tankers are too small or the travel distance is too far. Uh, our tankers are encountering a lot of problems in the way of traffic, tractors, bridges, detours. They're having to back up and turn around at the dump or the fill sites or we've got drivers that are getting lost. Uh, incompatible hose fittings causing issues. Uh, problems at the drafting site, you know, once again, vacuum leaks, bad primers, or the wrong driver. 
Uh, water can't be moved between the truck or the dump site fast enough. Maybe we got a bad truck layout. We don't have enough firefighters to do it. Or the dump site layout's just not conducive to getting the tankers offloaded fast enough. Or once again, command or dispatch delayed the initiation of our tanker assignment. So why do buildings burn down? There's lots of individual reasons as we've discussed, but what are some of the common root causes? I think one of the most common is that our operations are often planned around ideal manning levels, not bare minimum manning levels. We really need to have SOPs that reflect the 1030 in the morning on a Wednesday response, not the Saturday afternoon response or Sunday afternoon response. A lot of times our rural operations require a large number of vehicles to implement. Uh, most of our sustained water supply operations are most always dependent upon these very vehicle manpower intensive tanker shuttles or very vehicle and intensive hose lays, these vehicle intensive hose lay operations. Uh, so what ends up happening, they're often delayed, they're undersized or they're undermanned because it's impractical to keep calling companies out just in case. Eventually we end up in the decried, decry wolf syndrome where nobody comes anymore because we keep recalling them. Uh, this is particularly true where we drop hose on a regular basis and we don't use it or the tanker assignments are getting there, halfway there, and you're just recalling them all the time. Uh, the other thing about these vehicle and manpower intensive operations is they have little to no short-term impact on firefighting. We gotta remember, fires grow exponentially. They don't grow linearly. What we're doing to counter the fire has to happen exponentially as well as the fire growing exponentially if we're gonna get ahead of it. Uh, the other thing too is we're, we're still dependent upon drafting. Hundreds and hundreds of years we're depending upon drafting operations which are finicky. It's a finicky practice at best. It's manpower intensive. You need a driver that really has the knack. And, and it's prone to delays due to the slightest problem and reduced pumping capacities at high lifts. There's also some cultural issues in the fire service that we need to address. So as we go through the slide I want to keep in mind that these don't all apply to every fire service, fire department, every region. These are just things that people have told me in my travels. So I've kind of thrown this all together. So don't think that this is like a uh, I'm, I'm lambasting the fire service. I guess that's the right word. I'm just putting together a bunch of things that I've heard people tell me for why they believe they don't need to make improvements. Uh, you know, one of the common ones out there is our neighbors don't expect miracles. They just want us to try. Uh, sometimes they believe it. Hey, you know what? The fellow built his house there, and if it burns down, so be it. Uh, others have told me, hey, the property owners out here pay more for their insurance because they live in a rural area. They know that, and they expect losses to be higher than usual. Uh, another thing I've heard often is, hey, we can't work miracles living off a of pancake breakfast, sandwich sales, and hall rentals. And this is a true statement. Uh, uh, it's, it's very difficult to make improvements if you're living like this. Uh, but one of the things that's out that we need to think about is, hey, how can we get other people interested in helping us financially to improve ourselves? And, and I really think that one of the keys there is we need to make sure people understand what we can and what we can't do on a realistic basis. We can't brag about the Sunday afternoon tanker shuttle drill. We have to talk about what we can do 40 hours a week when everybody's at work. Uh, the other thing is too is you know, there's folks out there who say hey we've always done it this way and we're really good at it. So they don't they, they're very set in their ways they don't want to look at other ideas because some of the things that are out there the new technologies that are out there are different than what we've seen. It's different than what your father saw it's different than what your grandfather did. Uh, but there's new technologies out there that could help us address some of the uh, shortcomings. So in summary, buildings basically burn down because our water supplies often don't satisfy the needed fire flow. Our water supplies can't sustain the needed fire flow long enough or achieve it consistently enough to allow us to reach extinguishment. Our equipment or tactics don't always result in optimal application of the water we do have available. Our culture sometimes accepts excessive fire losses as, a, as just a thing that has to happen. Uh, in the remainder of the series, we're going to discuss strategies, concepts, and technologies that could be implemented to avoid some of the pitfalls we've discussed and to bring your rural water supply operations into the 21st century. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind is when I, we talk about these things, these are things that can't really be implemented on the fly on the fire ground. We really need to breed these into our culture, get them into our standard operating guidelines and procedures so that these things just occur on the fire ground. I hope you found this presentation to be useful, thought-provoking, and I hope to hear your feedback. All my contact information listed below. Once again, my name is Stephen Haynes. Please take care 
and we'll see you at the next uh, presentation.